For today's video, we're going to be discussing, once again, free-to-play design. More specifically, how can you spot pay-to-win elements in a game? And we're going to go from the most overt to the most covert examples. It's been a while since our last piece about free-to-play and pay-to-win design. And since then we've had a lot of discussions and a lot more in terms of seeing where the market went and kind of try to shake things up. And I'm going to kind of toss in Ramin's name throughout this cast and maybe if I say it three times he'll just magically appear in a corner somewhere. But pay to win has always been the death nail for any free to play or heavy or heavily microtransaction based game. As I said at, before the intro, we're going to start in the order of kind of the most overt, and then we're going to go kind of more covert or kind of more implicit examples. Because it's important to kind of see how much things have changed and also traps to avoid. So, the first example of pay to win is very simple. You are literally paying for power, as in you are buying a unique advantage, game changing or game affecting, that somebody who is not paying will never get access to. So this could be as if we're playing a first person shooter and the most or the highest tier free gun goes up to 60 points of damage and the paid gun starts at 90 points of damage. That right there is explicitly buying power. And when that happens, it is undoubtedly pay to win. There's no way for a free player to get access to that. And it always raises or creates that situation of an arms race. That they can just keep scaling things up with new purchases. Therefore, making it basically just a never endless cycle of buying items. Now, going back a little bit. The next example of pay to win is when somebody is able to circumvent or get around time. As we've said before, when we're playing any kind of video game like this, the two inherent values that have to be weighed are money and time. Some people don't care about spending hours on hours on end playing a game, but they will raise a huge fuss if you ask them to spend a dollar. Other people, their time is so precious that they'll rather just spend $20, $30 on lock something than even have to spend hours or even minutes at a time having to farm resources. But the important point is that both groups need to be able to make progress. And the thing that we've seen from a lot of developers, especially in the AAA space, is focusing more on money as the major metric. So they'll basically make time so horrible that, again, it makes it get to that point where why should you spend or why should you play this game for a long period of time? You can just buy all the options. If you remember with For Honor when it was originally launched, there was a lot of trouble with the game because of the fact that you, a free player would have to play the game for like three years to unlock all the content someone could just buy outright in like a few minutes. And this is, of course, another big point about loot boxes. And we don't play a lot of free-to-play games here on the channel, which is why the only footage we have is from Minion Masters of me opening up loot box after loot box after loot box. Maybe there'll be some gameplay up there. Who knows? But, again, if the game is basically designed to punish people by playing it for long periods of time to unlock anything, that's another example of pay to win. Now... Another point that is very important when we're talking about this kind of pay to win aspects is can the paying players unlock in innate advantages that free players will never be able to get? And more specifically, it's unique advantages. We've seen many multiplayer and free to play games have boosters, consumables, things along those lines. That in of itself is not pay to win, but if there is an advantage that is 100% unique to spending money and the free players will never get it, that is giving an unfair advantage. 
And a big example of this came with Marvel Strike. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not Marvel Strike Force. That's our next ex example. This was a uh, Marvel Puzzle Quest. There's probably a uh, running trend here, I guess. But in Marvel Puzzle Quest, the only way to successfully or safely beat other opponents in kind of its league or competitive mode was to put on shields to protect your team while you weren't playing it. And what they did was that the free shield only was like 30 minutes or an hour, which is not that much in this game. If you wanted to guarantee your safely, you needed like a good, I think like two to three hour protection shield. And that could only be acquired through premium currency, aka spending real money. And like we said, you want to respect the time and the money of playing a game. And if somebody literally cannot do something as well as a paying player, that is a major problem. And again, if you have consumables that let's say award you bonus resources or speed up the leveling process, that, at least for this discussion, is on the later side. Because the free players will eventually be able to get there. But again, if we're saying that the free players take like two, three years, that's another story. Now, here is our final example of kind of the pay to win aspect, and this is the most covert one. And this one gets very tricky to spot for a lot of players, and as I already spoiled, it's from Marvel Strike Force. Marvel Strike Force is a game that is very much pay to win, but it's not pay to win in the same way as other games. As with a lot of these RPG or champion focused games, there are legendary or you know super elite tier characters you can unlock. Uh, Phoenix, Black Bolt, other Marvel properties I don't really know off the top of my head, and you get the picture. Nobody in the game can outright buy these characters. As in I can say, here's $300, give me my legendary character. That's good. But the requirements to unlock these characters are inherently weighed towards the whales. Each legendary character requires you to build a party of five specific characters, get them to enough uh, like five star rank, and again, you collect character shards via loot boxes. Though when you get enough shards, you unlock the higher uh, rank or higher rank of that character, and you have to do this to get them to five stars. That is completely up to RNG, and even if you spend money, you still have to make use of the loot boxes in a lot of times to get them. But it gets worse. You see, whenever a new legendary character is released, a free player literally cannot unlock that character on their first event. And this is not a case of getting good. The game is designed so that it will not pay out enough of those required shards for a free player to get them. No matter how much that free player plays the game, there are just not, it's just not possible. And that is a huge example of pay to win that a lot of people don't think about. Because again, the players are not directly buying power, but they are buying the means to get that power. And it's something you have to be really mindful of in a lot of these free-to-play games. Because like I said, the game never will say outright, you must spend $100 to get this great character. Instead, they're going to say, this character requires these five specific conditions. Oh, and those conditions may cost you like $30 to $50. And there are people, trust me, who have bought those characters or unlocked them day one. And to do that... I would estimate if you didn't have access to those characters, it probably would run you anywhere from three to five hundred dollars to get that character day one. And that is on the low end. If you you know have very bad luck with the loot boxes, you may be spending more money than that. And yet yeah, the we can page Ram mean right now for that one. But with that said, we're going to do our quick Patreon supporter and sponsor shout-out break now. And when we come back, I want to talk about another aspect of pay-to-win and free-to-play design that a lot of people don't discuss. And it's a very important one when it comes to kind of trying to legitimize these games in the mainstream eyes. 
And now for a quick shout out to our current Game Wisdom supporters and sponsors. Going forward, all Patreon supporters will get early access to our videos. And if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. If you're looking for more wisdom about game design, be sure to check out my latest offering of books, 20 Essential Games to Study, aimed for first-time developers and students looking for some inspiration for their upcoming games, and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers if you're interested in anything regarding 2D and 3D platforming design. They're both available in print, digital, and wherever books are being sold. I'm sure you probably were expecting me to show footage of that Ray Shell Legends game, but I can tell you that this video was not sponsored by them. And probably because of footage and discussions like this. This is from a video I did about South Park Phone Destroyer. This came out a few years ago. And South Park, along with a lot of the more again, I can use qu air quotes here, uh, higher quality mobile games features uh, synchronous PvP play. And there was this discussion, I actually got into trouble on Twitter with somebody, I know that's never happened before, because they were arguing about the legitimacy of eSports for free-to-play or microtransaction heavy games, and they brought up Clash Royale. And the person, she was talking about how for like their grand final tournament, nobody needed to spend money to compete in that tournament. And everybody was praising it and so on and so forth. And I asked her a question that she never responded to. I think she pulled the EA uh, run out of the room that Ramin was talking about. And what I asked was how much did those people spend to get to that point? And apparently this footage is just uh, me staring at the screen, so it wasn't frozen, people. And that is a very big thing about these kinds of free-to-play games. And for lack of a better term, I'm going to describe this phenomenon as breaking the pay-to-win wall. And what that means is that for all these games, that feature kind of competitive play or even again quote unquote competitive play there will always come a point where the top players of it will not have to worry about spending money again they have broken through that wall of the pay to win side and how this occurs is that for a lot of these games and sorry about the footage being all green here, that's just more my phone recording it rather than OBS. But for these games, it will always feature a mode that earns the most in-game resources. And typically, that is the player versus player mode, whether it is asynchronous play or synchronous. And or the, the third option, you're just fighting against the AI-controlled team. So in these modes, the top players, the ones who come in, like, usually it's like the top 100, maybe 150 pushing it. They will earn so many in-game resources, usually they'll either be unique things or just premium currency, that at some point they will not need to spend any money unless they are, again, focusing on getting whatever is the latest and greatest thing. It happened with South Park Phone Destroyer that the players who win the PvP leagues earn a lot of booster cards and premium resources that they can then funnel back into the game to boost their power. And again, what ends up happening is that for these players who either spend so much free time to get to that point or spend so much money, that the game inherently transforms into something else. And this is where things get very interesting, is that for the top players of these free-to-play games, it's almost like they're playing a different game, because money is no longer a factor. Everybody has access to the very best things, so it now becomes a contest of skill. It's not a case of, oh, this person won because they just spent more money than me. No, we all spent a lot of money. Now it's 
you know, I'm out being outplayed. And we see this in a lot of CCG-based games that have kind of the pro ladder or, again, like the Diamond League. I saw this watching a high-level Gwent play, for instance. There is footage of high-level play of South Park Phone Destroyer, as well as that Command Conquer free-to-play game. But the problem, as I'm sure you're all figuring out, is that how much money does it cost to get to that point? And this is why I have a problem with people trying to shout the praises of these games. That it may be an amazing game at full unlock, but does someone have to spend like $500 to $1,000 plus to get to that point? And will a 100% free player ever reach that section? And that is the big question here. And it's something that, again, when we talk to people in the monetization or the free-to-play market, they don't like to discuss this because it very much proves that these games are pay-to-win. With South Park Phone Destroyer here, I played a little bit of the PvP play, but I got absolutely dominated. And I couldn't make any more progress unless I grinded for hours on end on maps that would get progressively harder... Or again, I spend real money to open up loot boxes and hope I get those rare cards. And this is that, again, that double-edged sword for these games. That there is depth and some great elements to them. But they are hidden way behind a paywall that most players will never be able to witness. And like I said, even for the players who do break through that wall, they are still going to spend either a lot of in-game resources or real money whenever something new comes out. But again, for those players, they are probably banking so much premium currency that it's going to be very hard for them not to immediately acquire the next great thing. And like I said, it is great to get to that point. But most of us will never get there. Speaking of which, there's my question for this video. For those of you watching this, did you ever get to that point of breaking through the pay-to-win wall in any free-to-play game that you played? And you don't have to tell me numbers, but if you can give me like an estimate or just a roundabout how much you spent to get there, I'm just very curious. But with that said, to wrap things up, Pay to win is still very much in vogue when it comes to AAA development. It's just gotten a lot sneakier. Some developers are still foolish enough to try and make things overt with misleading or manipulated loot boxes. But like I said, whenever we have this discussion, it's important to understand that the developers are not stupid. They're not just closing their eyes and putting this stuff in. These elements are heavily analyzed and tracked to get maximum value. It's why these companies hire gaming or gambling experts to do these systems. And it's a disservice for when people say, oh, these developers are stupid for putting in loot boxes or for having these kinds of systems. They're not stupid for putting them in. They're just foolish because they got caught. And you have to be aware of these trends if you want to educate yourself, especially for any parents watching this video who have kids playing mobile and free-to-play games. However, thank you so much for watching this video. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where is in the art and science of games. Until next time, take care. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design. And come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.